Freshly roasted, fairly traded, full body, shade grown, vibrant, certified organic. What makes great coffee? Five roasts over five regions in the story of a coffee supply chain from farm to cup. here is to explore and reconsider this question, what makes great coffee? To do so, I've enlisted the help of my many friends at Dean's Beans Organic Coffee. Dean's Beans is a 100% employee-owned certified B corporation based out of Orange, Massachusetts. The company was founded by Dean Sycon in an environmental and indigenous rights lawyer back in 1993. Dean set out to prove coffee around the world could be bought, sold, and delivered to our cups without compromising the health and well-being of people in the planet. Dean offered his answer to the industry and consumers alike to this question, what makes great coffee? This episode mixes tasting with the very tactical of how we get from bean, or cherry rather, to finish brew. We'll talk organic coffee farming, the role of coffee cooperatives, the significance of fair trade, and also when you should or shouldn't put cream and sugar in your morning cup. I'm Corey Ames, your host, and this is the Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation Podcast. Let's start on the ground or in the soil and hear first from Roastmaster and head green coffee buyer at Dean's Beans Organic Coffee, Brendan Walsh. Coffee is grown only in the tropics, between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And the vast majority of coffee farmers, I think this is true of agriculture in general, but the vast majority are very small scale farmers. So they grow coffee on less than a few acres of land. So each individual coffee farmer probably only grows a couple bags of coffee a year. That'd be like a burlap sack of coffee, you know. We only buy from democratically run coffee cooperatives. Basically, the way it could work is that most coffee is either grown by a bunch of small scale farmers and pooled together for export or it's grown on like a very large estate and they grow enough coffee on this very large estate to produce like an entire container. So like the, the whole thing would basically go that it's a seasonal crop. So you get one harvest a year in most places. There's a couple regions of the world that are kind of geographically unique. So they get maybe two harvests a year. That seems to be places that are very close to the equator uh, that they might get two coffee harvests a year. But all of these small scale farmers rely, the vast majority rely on coffee as their sole income. So that means that they're only getting paid once a year right, mm-hmm. for their coffee harvest. It's nearly entirely harvested by hand. Coffee cherries, and especially where it's grown, like I saw this in Nicaragua, that it's usually shade grown in like kind of a heavy forested area. A lot of the areas are incredibly steep, like ridge or ravine-like, so there's no way you could get machinery in there. And also that coffee ripens kind of unevenly, so It's not like you can just strip an entire coffee tree one day when it's all ripe. You have to continually go back over the course of a few days and pick the cherries at like their precise ripeness, which is when they get red, but not too red because then they would be overripe and you don't want to pick them underripe because that's a whole nother thing. Twenty-five million smallholders produce 80% of the world's coffee. Smallholders, to be clear, are those who farm on land that is less than two hectares or roughly five acres in size. This according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. According to the Fair Trade Foundation, over 125 million people worldwide depend on coffee for their livelihoods. It takes newly planted coffee trees roughly three to four years to bear fruit. The majority of coffee-growing communities get one harvest per year, as Brendan mentioned. 
One harvest a year, picked by hand, the National Coffee Association says a good picker will pick anywhere from 100 to 200 pounds of coffee cherries each day, carefully choosing those only at peak ripeness. For many, that's their one source of income for the whole year. High stakes. Let's go on location with our first tasting to Ethiopia. I'll let Dean Saikon himself with an excerpt from his book, Java Trekker, Dispatches from the World of Fair Trade Coffee, read us in. The members of Nigella Garbatu have a lot of questions. Why are we only being offered 60 cents when last year we got a dollar? Our coffee is the same and the quality is very high. Why wouldn't the banks give us loans to harvest the beans this year? Half our crop rotted on the plant because we didn't have the money to pick it and ship it to the processors. How do I explain the Lords of the Ring? How do I tell them that even though some of us care about their families, the people who determine the price simply don't? I am the first fair trade purchaser and the first American coffee buyer ever to come here, and I don't relish the role of bringing bad news. The truth is, even the fair trade purchases will only be a drop in the bucket here. I can feel great about how I treat these farmers, but all around Negele are farm families that don't sell to fair traders. The kids who run by with swollen bellies and streaks of reddish hair are all the evidence I need to know that a diet of false banana, the only starch staple readily available, leads to malnutrition. Brendan, well, let, let's change pace a little bit and talk tasting. We got our all first right. one here. An Ethiopian roast. It looks like this is a single origin, a light roast from the Sidama zone in Ethiopia. Can you tell me a little bit about what I'm about to taste here? This is a washed Ethiopian. Most countries usually don't only wash coffee. Ethiopian does natural process and wash process. I think in general, Ethiopia has one of the most unique coffee flavors overall, regardless of the processing method. It's a pretty light roast. It's got kind of almost like a lemony floral aroma to it. The overall body of it is like fairly mild. It's not really heavy. What I like about it is that you get a lot of bright acidity that's almost like a fruit-like. It can be citric and fruit-like. So I taste some lemon in there or maybe some peach-like stone fruit. It has an overall almost black tea-like quality to it rather than your more traditional coffee flavor. It's the type of coffee you probably don't want to put cream sugar in. It tastes pretty good on its own, but it's kind of a unique flavor experience. So that's kind of what I like about it. From Ethiopia, we'll go back to the farm. When we come back from a quick break, we'll talk all things organic, shade-grown, bird-friendly, and more. Here's a word from our partners that make this show possible. The Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation Podcast is supported by Transform. Listen to the incredible We Transform Lives podcast to hear about the extraordinary impact of entrepreneurship and the business innovations driving social and environmental change in communities across Africa, South Asia, and beyond. Find We Transform Lives wherever you listen to your podcasts. And for more information, visit www.transform.global. Intrepid Travel is the world's largest travel B Corp, and its mission is to create positive change through the joy of travel. With more than 950 small group trips on every continent, Intrepid creates that change by taking travelers on soul-defining, life-changing adventures that give back to the communities they visit. Traveling with Intrepid, you can explore the greatest icon of ancient South America, Machu Picchu, on a guided tour. Or you can see Vietnam through an exciting mix of transport, including motorbike, sampan, junk-style boat, bus, and train. Intrepid Travel offers small group travel that's good all over. Good views, good friends, and good times with over 1,000 trips in more than 100 countries. You can find out more at intrepidtravel.com. Welcome back, y'all. Our supply chain story continues on the farm as Dean's Beans Green Bean Buyer 
Brendan Walsh shares more on the prevalence of organic farming practices and the significance and meaning behind the certifications in terms like bird friendly and shade grown. Some places actually organic farming has always been the default. Ethiopia is kind of like that. They've always grown coffee organically there, but there's the incentive to get certified, which actually not really all that long ago that a lot of co-ops in Ethiopia got organic certification because they'd been growing coffee organically all along. The benefit is that not all coffee is grown organically and coffee is the most heavily pesticided crop in the world. It, I think it took over from cotton um, and you know, you don't eat cotton, so it's probably a little bit more important. A lot of the pesticides that are being used on coffee farms are like the type of pesticides that are not allowed in the United States. The farmers probably don't get a whole lot of training on how to use them properly or pr being protected from using them. And all of that runoff gets into their community. So the importance of organic coffee for them is that they're protecting their environment and their families from dangerous pesticides and stuff like that. Another benefit of organic certification is that there is an organic premium per pound for coffee. So it's 40 cents per pound is the premium for organic coffee. So we talked about the sea market before. So let's say today the sea price was $1.50, right? So if you're growing regular old conventional coffee, the price without any kind of premiums, the price would be $1.50 a pound. If you're growing certified organic coffee, the price is automatically $1.90 per pound. And there's fair trade on top of that too, which the premium for fair trade coffee is 20 cents above that. And then there's a minimum price for fair trade that never goes below. So that recently just got raised. So the minimum price for fair trade coffee is $2.40, fair trade organic coffee is $2.40 per pound versus a dollar fifty that it would otherwise be. The fair trade premium gets redistributed in amongst the community by usually by a cooperative among the farmers. So there's extra twenty cents per pound that goes back into their communities. As far as bird friendly goes, there's migratory birds that migrate from the United States down to Central America in the winter. Usually it's central to Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras. But actually further down to even in Colombia and Peru, as it pertains to coffee, is that your farm could be certified to be like a bird-friendly habitat to migratory birds. Mm -hmm. The certification itself is developed by the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Council. And we found it to be important because a lot of roasting companies say that their coffee is shade-grown, but shade-grown is not really a certification, right? So there's no proving that coffee is coming from a shade grown farm. I mean, the importance of shade grown coffee is that a lot of people use this in their marketing, that shade grown coffee matures more slowly, which means it tastes better, which means it's sweeter and all these things like that. But on another layer, it's important because it's ensuring that the coffee's not grown on some hacked and slashed clear cut estate. And there's a striking difference between when you would look at a very large plantation of coffee that's all out in the sun versus a very small scale organic bird friendly coffee farm which looks like a native forest that happens to have coffee plants on the bottom level of the understory mm. so the bird friendly part of it is a pretty rigorous certification they're looking for a lot of things like the coffee has to be certified organic there has to be x number of different native trees in the area that there has to be X number of cover, like it's got to be more than 40% shade grown in every single area. There has to be X number of birds that are in that area, not just one species, but multiple species of birds to be considered bird friendly. So we found it was important because it's an, it's an extra layer of insurance to make sure that the farms are natural habitat for both birds and not a deforested area because deforestation is another problem too. Right. The carbon neutral part was Dean had a thing where he's planting trees in Peru to offset carbon here, but it grew into a whole reforestation project to mm. take back some land that had been clear cut in years past. So that's passed on 
to a Nicaragua too, that in addition to planting like native hardwood trees, we were funding some planting of fruit trees to both provide shade and also provide crop diversification for a different source of both food and also income on the local market by having a secondary crop to right. both eat and sell. Estimates suggest that of the total global coffee market, only about 3% of that coffee is produced organically, certifiably. As Brendan mentioned, organic farming is incredibly important. It's important for the health of our soils and natural ecosystems, the health of the farmers and their communities, and the health of the end consumer drinking that cup. The various certifications available to coffee farmers are a bit tricky. As Brendan mentioned, many things like organic farming or harboring bird-friendly habitats have been things many smallholder farmers have been doing all along, without recognition, or a premium compensation for that matter. Of course, there is a level of organization and infrastructure that is required for smallholders to become certified organic and earn themselves that organic premium, as well as become and participate in fair trade. This is where we can start to see the case for cooperatives, a means to organize many smallholders and their available resources. They can position themselves and protect themselves a bit better in an incredibly disfavorable global market. For us, in the journey through the supply chain, more on cooperatives next. But for now, a brief interlude as we go to the Amazonian highlands in Peru. We climbed up and down mountains for several more hours, finally arriving at a long line of cars and trucks toward dusk. We had arrived at the washed out bridge. The steel superstructure was twisted 45 degrees and came to an abrupt end halfway across. A single wooden lane with a steel cable for a handhold had been constructed to allow people to walk over the powerful bloated river below. On the other side, another group of farmers waved to us in recognition. Several young men vied for the honor, at the going rate, of carrying our bags across the span underneath a sign that read, Danger, do not cross this bridge. Downriver, a line of large trucks waited. I asked Esperanza what was going on. That's how we get our coffee across the river, and that's how supplies for the farmers in the town gets across. I watched as two large dugout canoes with huge outboard motors revved up parallel to the shore, their bows aimed upstream against the raging current. Long planks hewn out of jungle hardwoods straddled the two canoes, making a giant platform. Slowly, a full semi-trailer drove onto the platform, men on the left and right shouting a flurry of contradictory directions. Once the trucks were on board, the canoes roared forward at full throttle. The current was so powerful that the canoes made no progress, but slowly went sideways across the river. Once across, the canoes were secured to the muddy banks with ropes, and the trucks disembarked. Another truck loaded on the far side for the return voyage. I gained a new appreciation for my morning cup of coffee. Peruvian engineering. Esperanza. We're talking about one that we just left off right there, a Peruvian coffee. Again, single origin from the Amazonian highlands from the uh, Pengoa Cooperative, a medium roast. Can you tell me a little bit more about what I'm drinking here, Brendan? There overall percentage of organic certified coffee in Peru is pretty high compared to other parts of the world. I think Peru jumped early on certification for organic and they became a very large market for certified organic coffee. And overall, I find Peruvian to be, this one's roasted a bit darker than the Ethiopian. So it has a little more balance to it versus the Ethiopian had that bright acidity and little less body to it. Generally, Peruvian has lower acidity to, be, to, get, to begin with, but it's a little bit milder. We always think of Peruvian as just kind of like the, the sweet coffee, the mild and sweet coffee. It's more just kind of middle of the road, transparent type of overall coffee flavor. Tastes mm. just like a nice smooth cup of coffee.
Brendan, I, I would love, uh, as I prepare this this next brew, if you could get a little bit more specific for me as to the role and function of the cooperatives in the coffee growing communities that you know of. Most coffee farmers are pretty small scale. They may only produce a couple bags of coffee a year. And if you were a small scale coffee farmer that produced a couple bags of coffee a year, you're probably never going to be able to get that coffee like to the United States market on your own because it's probably prohibitively expensive to export two or three bags of coffee. Part of the idea behind a cooperative is that they pool all of the coffees in a community together to build up enough to be viable for export. The general size of a coffee export is a full container, which is between 250 and 300 burlap bags of coffee. Each one of those mm -hmm. weighs 150 pounds. So it's a lot. Cooperatives can probably look a little bit different depending on what part of the world you're in. Usually a community or a few neighboring villages or towns form a cooperative together where they pool all their coffee together, process it, export it together. They're democratically run. So the head of a cooperative will be voted upon and elected. There's like a board of directors. They have meetings and they vote on issues and they have discussions about issues and come to consensus. The cooperative is usually in charge of distributing the fair trade premium back to the farmers. Mm. So usually every cooperative has at least one person or maybe a couple people who's a trained agronomist. So they're able to provide technical support back to the farmers because five cents of the 20 cents of the fair trade premium is supposed to go back to either increasing productivity or increasing coffee quality. That's where the agronomist comes in to have meetings with farmers to teach them more efficient methods for using organic fertilizers or preventing coffee diseases or overall soil health and stuff like that. It can look a little bit different around the world, but it seems the Latin American example. Most, most of these countries in Latin America probably at one point had some kind of civil conflict slash socialist guerrilla movement and the cooperative spirit is a bit left over from that time where like everybody has this mentality of working together to achieve their common goals. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think it worked out really well, especially what we saw in Nicaragua, where some of the farmers that we met, met with were former Sandinista guerrillas back from the eighties. And, um, they're just really working towards improving their communities. I guess what what's the alternative if if those cooperatives didn't exist and what's your understanding of how great you know a portion of the coffee growing population is not part of some cooperative a common thing in the past was so small scale coffee farmers could just sell their coffee to well in central or in Latin America they're known as a, a coyote a coyote it's just a guy who travels around and will buy your coffee. If you want to get rid of it today, like, hey, I'll pay you probably very little for it, but, you know, you could get paid today. So that seems to be an option that they just sell it to someone on the local market who may just turn around and export it, you know, but acquired it through less than ethical means. Another example is like a very large estate that could just be run by some wealthy person and just hires labor for very cheap and doesn't treat workers very well at all. I would say that would be the alternative is essentially buying like mass produced estate coffee or selling to a middleman for less than the desired value of the coffee. A farmer is probably not getting the entire amount that they should be getting for the coffee because there's other costs down the road that get up to that 
price of the final product. Maybe you didn't say, I'm just imagining this, but the majority of the world's coffee growers are small scale farmers, right? Or am I, am I wrong on that? They are, but in the world of coffee, like fair trade organic coffee is a very, very small percentage of the mm. overall coffee market. So specialty coffee, which is higher quality coffee, which is what we're dealing with for like a specialty coffee company. The traditional companies like say something like Folgers slash like Dunkin' Donuts, so like the, the large conglomerate ones would be like conventional coffee or Starbucks too. And then there's specialty coffee, but specialty coffee is like 5% of the entire coffee market. Fair trade organic coffee is 5% of the specialty market. So it's in, insanely small. Should it be assumed that the rest of the coffee world is is living and dying off of the sea pricing, the commodity pricing? Yeah, I would say most likely because a lot of organic coffee or fair trade coffee too doesn't get sold as fair trade organic. They'll just gotcha. take whatever they can get, which is probably the sea price. Yeah. Gotcha. So okay. even though you might have gone through the trouble of getting organic certification or fair trade certification, you might not have a buyer. And then in that case, you're stuck basically taking what you can get. As reported by Fair Trade International in late March 2023, the new fair trade minimum price for washed Arabica beans with no organic premium, which represents more than 80% of all fair trade coffee sold, is $1.80 per pound an increase of $0.40 cents over the previous price. February 7th, 2023, the C price or commodity price of coffee was $2.52 per pound. A day after International Coffee Day, October 2nd, 2023, eight months later, the C price or commodity price of coffee was $1.49 per pound. January 6th, 1986, the C price or commodity price of coffee was $2.68 per pound. For what it's worth, $1 in 1986 is worth $2.80 today due to inflation. So clearly, a couple things seem to be true. First, farmers have historically earned more per pound of coffee than they do today. Second, Farmers' earnings from their coffee are extremely volatile and can change in a matter of a day, let alone the months and years between planting coffee trees and harvesting the cherries. Do you think it costs farmers more, the same, or less to produce coffee than it did in, say, 1986? Something seems off here. The global coffee market has grown substantially over time. Revenues and profits for companies like Starbucks, Pete's Coffee, and Nespresso continue to grow. Starbucks revenues in 2022, $32.25 billion. Nespresso revenues in 2022, just over $7 billion. Pete's Coffee revenues in 2022, $983 million. Meanwhile, farmers appear to have a lesser chance to make a profit on their harvest in any given year. This system, as it seems, is fundamentally broken. The individuals, the farmers, of whom this industry is completely dependent, have been already and are increasingly put into precarious positions. That's putting it lightly. Fortunately, there is a different way of buying coffee. And later in our conversation, Brendan will continue on by telling us how buying is different at Dean's Beans. Believe it or not, it's not wildly complicated. There's no arguing and shouting on a, a trading floor in New York City. No negotiation, even. It's just fair. We're going to go to a quick break, but when we come back, we'll be tasting another Dean's Beans brew from Honduras. And then Brendan will take us through how Dean's Beans buys their coffee beans. A good company is picking a fight with the everyday products harming our planet. They're replacing plastic with plants, localizing production chains, reusing materials that otherwise risk being wasted, and on top of all of that, they are dedicating part of their revenue to environmental and humanitarian causes. 
Bottom line, a good company believes every individual choice matters. They strive to make those choices easier. And so join the good fight and check out some of my favorite products from a good company, such as their stone paper notebooks and natural grass pens at agood.com. Bodhi Surf and Yoga, the first B Corp certified surf and yoga camp in the world, is located in Bahia, Baena Uvita, Osa, Costa Rica, a small, still relatively untouched community on the Southern Pacific Zone, situated at the footsteps of the Marino Baena National Park, a place where the jungle, ocean, and mountains meet, a unique backdrop for a place to immerse yourself in nature, become energized, and awaken your mind body earth connection. The word Bodhi is Sanskrit for awareness, a concept that is central to the activities and lifestyles of surfing and yoga, and an attitude that Bodhi Surf and Yoga shares with those it comes into contact with, students, guests, fellow community members, and businesses alike. Bodhi Surf and Yoga utilizes surfing, yoga, nature immersion, and community engagement as a way to facilitate memorable, unique, and, and extremely substantive learning and travel experiences. I can attest to this completely and wholeheartedly. Annie and me had the incredible opportunity to spend a week with the folks at Bodhi for our honeymoon a few years back, a beautiful, comfortable, but still simple lodge with incredible daily surf and yoga instruction. I would say that Bodhi is responsible for me actually enjoying surfing for the first time. So awaken your inner Bodhi and, and check out Bodhi Surf and Yoga Camp in Uvita, Costa Rica. To learn about their latest vacation packages, go to growensemble.com backslash Bodhi. That's B-O-D-H-I. All right, welcome back, y'all. Unfortunately, the folks in Honduras are among the newest cooperative partners to join in the Dean's Beans family. So alas, as Dean's Java Trekker was published in 2007, we're going to have to go without a beautiful travel narrative of Dean's to set the tasting scene. The migration celebration, which mm -hmm. likewise is a, a single origin coming from Honduras, a velvet roast, as you informed me that that might have been an invention of y'all's uh, yeah. on here. But tell me a little bit more uh, about this one here, Brendan. This one comes from a cooperative in Honduras called Comsa. This one specifically comes from the group of women farmer producers who they have a separate coffee product grown by only women farmers that they call Manos de Muir, which means hands of women. It's bird friendly certified as well. This one, we roasted a little bit darker than the previous two. This one actually gets to second crack, which in roasting terms... There's a first crack and then really dark coffees hit what's called second crack when you're going into French roast territory. So the flavor profile kind of changes a little bit and you lose some of the origin nuance. But what happens is that that sweetness caramelizes due to the higher roasting temperatures. So the sweetness kind of changes to a bit more bittersweet flavor and body increases, so you're getting a fuller body mouthfeel versus some of the lighter roast, which is a little bit on the lighter side. So overall, that's when chocolate notes start to come out of coffee is at this level. Mm. And usually the acidity starts to get really muted at this point. So the acidity gets lower and the body increases and the chocolatey rich flavor increases with a little bit more roast level. It's kind of middle of the road, like not too light, but not too dark and like mm. still tasting pretty good. So Brendan, if you wouldn't mind talking to me a little bit about the, the buying process from a, a Dean's beans, as an example, how are you setting prices with these cooperatives? What is the negotiation, you know, if anything, if you could call it that, what does that look like? We bought coffee from the same cooperatives for years and years and years. So we have a personal relationship. Normally what happens, coffee is a seasonal thing. So you learn over a couple of years, like when the right time of year it is to start inquiring about, you know, the coffee that is about to be harvested. 
So that's usually like, I don't know, a few months before it's ready. Um, so essentially we just get in touch with them and say, Hey, we're looking to buy a container this year. And as far as pricing goes, we don't really do any type of negotiating at all. I'm never going to try to nickel and dime prices down. The price that they're asking for is just the price we're going to pay. And that's completely fine with our, you know, they know better than we do. That being said, the fair trade minimum price just recently increased by quite a bit, which I think is a great thing overall for the coffee world because it guarantees that a lot more people are going to be getting a lot more money for their coffee. We've always been paying a fair trade above fair trade minimum anyway, but since it's increased that much, we were happy right off the bat to be like, okay, this is great. We're fully committed to paying you $2.40 a pound minimum from now on. Then basically the process for us is they send us a pre-shipment sample. So they send a sample of coffee that I do a small little sample roast of and try just to make sure it's good. I'm not super nitpicky about it. Like I said, we, you know, we trust these guys. We know their coffee is going to be good from year to year. I've never been like, nope, sorry, this isn't good enough. We're not going to buy the coffee this year. I mean, there's been a couple times where you can find an issue in the pre-shipment sample. That's something that we can discuss. It's just about having that communication that's important. And so once the pre-shipment sample is approved, then the coffee gets shipped. It gets loaded into a 20-foot shipping container. If it's in Central or South America, it takes about one month at sea to get here. Stuff from Asia and Africa takes about two months to get here in a container. Early on... Dean was one of the founding members of Cooperative Coffees, which is an importer in the United States. But their idea was to do a little bit better and only import coffee that came from coffee cooperatives. Dean was a founding member there. We ended up leaving at one point because Dean had managing stake in the company there and needed the money to send his children to college. Since then, we've been working with Royal Coffee, who is an importer in California, we kind of have like a reciprocating relationship with Royal. Often we're like, hey, we found this coffee. It's really good. We're not going to go through an entire container a year, but maybe you guys want to buy this container and then we'll take half of it or something. Then that coffee is introduced to the, the United States market through like Royal selling it as well as us. So that's happened a few times. They ship it out and the next place it shows up is here at our back door where we unload it. Listening to the way and means through which Dean's Beans buys coffee from their various cooperative partners around the world, I can't help but hear the words of my friend Eric Henry, a large volume t-shirt printer in Burlington, North Carolina. The relationship goes far beyond the PO. A relationship beyond the purchase order. It's not much. It might not seem that different. But in that, is everything. A relationship beyond the purchase order means you look beyond the price. You get to know who you're doing business with. You get to know why they're doing business. And maybe so do you. That's why a Dean's Beans will gleefully pay a fair trade premium, profit share with their various cooperative partners, hang with them when crisis, turmoil, or natural disaster inevitably comes. No negotiation. Long-term relationships. Relationships vastly beyond the PO. Now, let's take quick trips to Nicaragua and Sumatra. I watched the boogeymen carry 150-pound sacks of coffee on their backs up and down a gangplank that was, in fact, a narrow board hacked from a tree trunk. The boogeyman offered to let me come on board, provided I carried a sack like everyone else. I looked down into the tetanus-laced waters of Jakarta Harbor and demurred, whereupon they offered to carry me and a sack of beans up on one of their backs. I sprinted up the plank on my own to the laughter of the crew. The hundred-foot vessel was made entirely by hand, without power tools, on the beach of one of the islands in the Makassar Strait, just the other side of Borneo. 
I can't even put in a screw without an electric screw gun anymore. The planks were held into the ribs of the schooner by trenels, tree nails, which are carved wooden pegs. The masts were gigantic tree trunks, still exhibiting the twists and turns of growing on a windy coast. Much of the rigging was hand-wrapped hemp, which is surprisingly strong, although hunks of iron plate and probably pirated steel wire appeared here and there. The crew let me look into one of the coffee bags on deck. I politely declined their offer to go into the hold down below. It amazed me that these burlap sacks and their contents would survive the trucking, shipping, craning, and overall abuse they would be subject to on their wonderfully long journey from village Indonesia to the cafes of America and Europe. When I show farmers photos of their coffee in the burlap bags in our roastery, they are as amazed as I am. The coffee lands of Nicaragua were sown with more than 130,000 landmines during the decade after the revolution ended in 1979. Many were placed along the Honduran border by the newly elected government to intercept the U.S. funded and U.S. organized counter-revolutionaries or Contras. The Contras were a hodgepodge of the former dictator's brutal National Guard and security teams disgruntled farmers, conservative businessmen, and just plain thugs. President Reagan called them freedom fighters in a pre karl Rove marketing campaign. When he couldn't get congressional support for funding them anymore, our president turned to the Iranians, who had stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and captured all the personnel, and began the Iran-Contra guns for hostage scandal. The Contras, in turn, planted many of the mines throughout the country, where they were used primarily as weapons of terror, but the mines had no politics. They indiscriminately dismembered or killed whoever stepped on them or tripped the wires attached to their triggers. The mines hung in trees or were buried in the roads and paths of the Nicaraguan countryside. Most insidiously, the Contras planted them in the coffee fields to maim and kill soldiers who went to help the coffee far harvest, the largest source of income for the population and the country. Unlike organized minefield operations, the mines in Nicaragua were placed here and there in what seemed at the moment to be a strategic area or where a resting soldier or Contra felt like getting rid of them. They were covered over by growing vegetation. The flooding, earthquakes, and hurricanes that ravaged Central America annually moved the mines around the countryside, presenting new dangers every season to the farmers in the fields and the children on the roads to school. The vegetation and erratic movement have made the job of finding the mines for removal nearly impossible. Let's divert to talk about this Mocha Sumatra, which is the first multi-origin that we're tasting here medium dark roast from Nicaragua and Sumatra. That's yeah. what we're at. This is Dean's original blend. So that's why I thought it was important. It was the first thing that he played around with adding a couple different origins together to make a blend. There's traditionally an old blend called Mocha Java. Actually, we have a Mocha Java blend too. But the original blend was Mocha Java, which is beans from the port of Mocha, which is in Yemen. And mm -hmm. then from Java, which is in Indonesia. Those two coffees blended together. Dean kind of did that, but instead of using coffee from Yemen and Java, coffee from Sumatra and then from Nicaragua, the coffee from Nicaragua has a pretty good chocolate note to it as well. Some people get confused with that, like the mocha thing, like they think it means there's chocolate in there, yeah. but it's just a chocolatey flavor in Nicaraguan. So it's a mostly light roast, Nicaraguan and Sumatran put together. And then there's a splash of French roast on top of it. What's neat about doing that is you get some flavor combinations that you wouldn't otherwise get just in a single roast on its own. You taste some light roast stuff, but you also have some dark roast stuff going on too. The dark roast adds a little bit more body to it and also more of a roasty aftertaste where the lighter coffees in there are kind of adding to the overall smoothness and sweetness. This one has Sumatran in it too, which... 
Sumatran coffee has its own unique processing method that isn't really used anywhere else in the world. So it affects the flavor of it overall too. So Sumatran coffee is usually known for being like the quintessential low acidity coffee and also very heavy bodied coffee. As far as single origin coffees go, I feel like Sumatran was one of the, the original valued single origin coffees. And it's definitely tastes a bit different than most of your traditional Central American coffees or South American coffees or stuff from Africa. It's its, its own unique thing, basically. Brennan, we left off with the beans arriving at the roastery. Take us, take us from there. What does that look like? This is delightfully low tech too. The container shows up with 250 to 300 burlap bags just piled into the back of it. And then we get to unload that onto pallets. That's the cheapest way to do it basically. So I've been doing it for quite a few years. Me and one other guy basically just lift one bag at a time and stack them on a pallet and then drive them off into the warehouse. It's a nerve wracking part of it to me is when the coffee is getting shipped across the ocean, because usually when it goes wrong, that's when it could go wrong. You know, it's out at sea. The containers are sealed, but it's exposed to the elements and stuff. I've found over the years that I try to avoid getting coffee shipped at least here to us in Massachusetts during the winter, because they tend to get sweaty. You know, there'll be condensation built up on the inside of the container. One time I remember we got a container of decaf that the decaf facilities in Mexico, and they shipped it here in the middle of winter. And when it showed up, when we started unloading that container, we got halfway through it and the bags were warm in the middle. It retained that heat from Mexico, like two weeks later, three weeks later. So it gets here, we unload it. We have a warehouse here that we built about 10 years ago when we started buying full containers and we built this warehouse basically for the purpose of being able to store a lot of coffee here so we could buy containers directly rather than have to buy them through an importer and get them you know, a dozen pallets at a time. We're able to store the entire container here in the warehouse. There's a little bit of staggering because coffee shows up at different times throughout the year, but we store the, all the coffee here and then we roast it as we need it. Coffee comes in a burlap sack, but lately over the past few years, a lot of uh, places have started using this inner plastic bag. It's called Green Pro. It's not quite a plastic bag. It's a one-way one -way barrier, so it'll allow the coffee to breathe moisture out, but it won't let any moisture in. I found that to be super important inside the container. It avoids all those issues of moisture and helps to preserve it here for a longer period of time. Coffee can, after a year, it starts to fade a little bit. It may not be the type of thing that everybody would notice, but coffee that's a year old doesn't taste quite as good as it did when it was a month old green coffee. So the Grain Pro bag helps to protect that too. So we roast it here, but we have two roasters. They're both 70 kilos, which is an entire burlap bag of coffee per roast, basically. Uh, roast takes about 15 minutes on average, and you're just trying to roast it at least past what we call first crack, which is when most of the flavor starts to develop inside the bean. And then anything past that is dependent on what you're trying to do. So like a lighter or a medium roast, you roast till just past first crack or all the way through it. And then darker roast, you go up to second crack. And the temperature range of this is light roaster about 410 degrees to 420. And a French roast goes all the way up to about 460 to 465 degrees. So French roasts are a little nerve wracking because everything happens really fast once you get up past second crack. And the time and temperature difference between a good French roast and burnt is like really, really tight. Back in 2006, Dean's Beans was one of the first companies in Massachusetts 
to install solar panels on their facilities. Their colorful and eye-catching coffee bags are backyard compostable after you rip off the tintai. It's as if every detail in every individual from farm to cup is accounted for. Sure, Dean's Beans might not be perfect, but they will be the first to tell you that. And they'll be the first to tell you where else they need to improve. So what makes great coffee? I think we're getting closer to our answer. But before we do, let's go to Papua New Guinea to taste one more roast. We sat on the ground, on our butts or on logs, in a makeshift canvas tent put up behind the bamboo platform. Iggy and Kekas convened the meeting after a short prayer from the pastor. Jesus Christ in heaven, please help us get more money for our coffee. Amen, replied the congregation. Iggy spoke at length about the need to organize with other farmers in the province and beyond. I asked lots of questions about how the farmers planted, harvested, and processed their coffee. Group cooperation for economy of scale was an alien concept. Every family did it for themselves. They harvested in small family groups, trudged the beans down to the nearest river to depulp them by hand, smashing a handful at a time with river stones to remove the beans from the surrounding red fruit. Afterwards, they carried the beans back to their huts to dry. The family had to stay with their beans by the river and at the hut for fear of rascals who would steal their only cash crop. Since the farmers had no cars or trucks, they carried the beans on their backs miles to the road and sat, waiting for a buyer to come along. Sometimes they waited a day and a night and a day again. They took what the buyer offered, no negotiation. I asked how long they waited to depulp the beans after harvest, the time it took them to depulp the bag of beans, and how long they dried them in the sun. The farmers talked and talked, arguing about the times, which seemed different for each family. It got a bit rough and tumble. One farmer went on a bit how hard it was to take his beans down the mountain. The Ring of Fire, another multi-origin, darkest of the bunch here that you provided me coming from Timor, Sumatra, and Papua New Guinea. What, uh, what should we know about this one? It's called Ring of Fire because it comes from the Ring of Fire of volcanic islands in the south, Southeast Asia, Sumatra, Timor, and Papua New Guinea. The Sumatran is a type of coffee that stands up pretty well to a dark roast. So that's one of the reasons it's in there too. It doesn't, it, you can roast it pretty dark and it still tastes good. And Timor and Papua New Guinea as well are two other coffee growing countries in that region that their coffee is pretty well suited to dark roasting. They're unique coffees compared to Central and South America too. Asian coffees are almost, they've got the kind of the spiciness going on usually, low acidity, mm -hmm. low acidity, spiciness, and full body. This one, we roast it pretty dark. Like I said, it's our best selling French roast. Actually, I think it's our best selling coffee overall. I try to take it just about as far as it can go without roasting it too dark. Well, what happens when you roast coffee too dark is that you lose all of the good stuff and you're basically left over with charcoal water. Everything gets really thin and just tastes burnt. So try to keep it so it's still got nice body to it. It's got like a smoky aftertaste. You kind of get a little bit of that like spicy, almost dark chocolatey flavor in there. Yeah. I put cream and sugar in and I think that really makes it taste pretty robust overall. I once said to uh, a woman who was in charge of social programs for Starbucks years ago, Starbucks could be the greatest company in the world if only they do fair trade. The heck with the rest of it. If they paid farmers more money, they would have more impact than any company in the world. And she said, yes, we could be the greatest company in the world, but we won't because we will not do that. 
Why won't we do that? Because we don't want to give that profit to the farmers. We want that to go to the shareholders. What Dean has said, and I just love it, I'm saying it all the time, is that we are in the business of social and economic and environmental justice, and we sell coffee to do that. Dean and Beth offered to bring me with them to Nicaragua. I, you know, I've spent a, a long time in coffee and know most of the technical stuff about it. But it's a whole lot more to me than I originally anticipated. And when we were down there, Merling, who's the head of protocol, she's the general manager, she said that a lot of people come down here to visit us. A lot of roasters or importers, they'll come to visit, but usually what they all do is they come to the, the Beneficio, which is their large production facility, They'll go to the cupping lab, they'll cup some coffee, they'll pick the coffees that they want to buy, but they do it with no face, you know, like they're just there to make a deal and they're never interested in going out and visiting with any of the farmers. A lot of companies do every year go down and cup all the coffees that they're going to buy. They send a buyer down to each co-op to try the coffee beforehand, but it's lacking that deeper kind of connection. Not many people realize that coffee is grown by millions of people around the world who are barely making a living by doing it, and that's because of all of these external pressures are pushing the price of coffee low. It'd be a lot better if most coffee roasters just starting to pay more money for coffee and agreeing that we need to value this commodity a lot more than it's currently valued. Value, connection, social, economic, and environmental justice. Impact, not necessarily the words that might first come to mind, when we originally posed this question, what makes great coffee? Certainly not words you or I use when someone asks us, how do you take it? Commoditizing anything, not just coffee, takes our consideration or valuation of any one thing from who or how to what do I have to pay for it. But that's not exactly a question for ourselves, us as consumers of coffee, but rather a question of industry. Go to deansbeans.com right now and see what you'd have to pay for a bag of coffee. Maybe a couple of dollars more than what you'd see Starbucks selling for at your closest grocery. Maybe right on par. I guarantee it doesn't cost as much as you think. But behind every bag of Dean's Beans organic coffee, there's a story. And most importantly, a story you want to hear. There's a connection. There's a level of depth, care, and partnership. And in my opinion, a level of craft that's hard to come by from coffee growing community to roastery to cup. So what makes great coffee? So much more than we see, feel, experience, and clearly know. Price is a consideration for sure, but not first the price per cup or bag that we might buy at the store or cafe. That's so far along in the story. First, it's the price per pound that farmers, their families, and their communities get to put back in their pocket. Cheaper coffee costs somebody something. The question is, who is it costing? For us, it's a difference of a few bucks, not an insignificant thing, but for others, farmers, coffee-growing communities, it's maybe much more than we'd like to know. Starbucks or whomever has and will continue to race to the bottom. The problem is, without awareness and growing consciousness, it's all of us that they take down with them. I don't know about you, but I refuse to let Starbucks and Howard Schultz set the minimum bar. My, and I know your, standards are much higher than that. There's no craft there. There's no care. There's no depth. It's substanceless. In a world ruled by commodity pricing, in a world ruled by economics, quality, craft, and connection, lose all meaning. 
The great thing about great coffee, in my opinion, is that only part of the equation is subjective. Light or dark roast, French pressed, poured over, or good old drip, cream and sugar or black, how you take your cup of coffee, that's completely up to you. But another piece to that, errors on more certainty, thankfully, yes or no questions, that anyone selling coffee to you should be able to answer. But was it fairly traded? Were farmers fairly and ethically treated? What makes great coffee? Maybe our best starting question is what was the price paid to the farmers per pound? I hate that the Starbucks's, Walmarts, etc. of the world put us as consumers in the position to bear the burden of their ethical and moral abdications, weighing the often very real consideration of saving a few bucks with each purchase. But you and me, thankfully, we can't and we won't be fooled. Their great certainly isn't mine. Whether we're talking about what makes great coffee or what makes a great coffee business, for that matter. An incredible irony to me is that it's the Dean's Beanses of the world of business who seem to be constantly swimming upstream. Oh, fair trade, organic, direct relationships with farmers and coffee growing communities. Oh, you, you can't make a business out of this. It's not how the world works. 30 or so years later, Dean's Beans is still hanging around, growing every year, profitable every single year of the last three decades. And you pick up a book like this, and you think, man, I can't help but believe this is what life is about. Travel the world, make friends, close connections, and stories from countries the world over. Make and build something meaningful and beautiful that serves others. Something that people would miss if it were gone tomorrow. Drink deep, as Dean himself has said, because your coffee will never taste the same. To understand what makes great coffee, what makes great anything, we have to go deep. Actually, I'll rephrase that. We get to. Our understandings of justice in trade and society in general cannot be confined to a formula. Fair trade, or any movement that is intended to improve the quality of life for people, is more accurately seen as a process. The more we work with the peoples in this book and beyond, the deeper we plunge into the dynamics of their societies, their ecologies, and their economies. Each layer reveals a more profound set of relationships that we must consider as we evolve towards a more humane and just relationships. Being open to the experiences of each culture not only makes us more aware, but also makes our lives richer. Thus, the tales in this book are only footsteps on a long and continuous trail. All right, y'all, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for watching or listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation Podcast. If you want to learn more about our friends at Dean's Beans, perhaps try some of their freshly roasted, fairly traded beans, go to deansbeans.com. As well, if you enjoyed this production, I recommend checking out my newsletter, The Weekly Ensemble, where each week I send you a meditation that explores the art of living and working sustainably. To get the next email in your inbox and join the thousands of social entrepreneurs who do already, go to growensemble.com backslash newsletter. And lastly, if you'd like to support the show, the greatest way to do so is hit the like and subscribe buttons on YouTube, leave a review on your favorite podcasting platform. You can find out more about all that, again, by signing up for my weekly newsletter at growensemble.com backslash newsletter. All right, y'all. Until next time.